Hello everybody, I am Jessica Henry Gray and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm taking a little um, kit, my watercolor sketching kit, and I'm out in the woods. Now normally I paint in oils on my channel, so if you're new here, um, that's typically what most of my videos are about. But today I'm going to show you how I get out and just do some watercolors and maybe a little sketch or whatever. Love it. Look, at, look at how peaceful this forest is. And, I just sit here and listen to the birds and the quiet. So I hope you enjoy this video and get a lot out of it. Be sure to like and subscribe if you're new to my channel. Um, check out some videos below. Hope you enjoy this one. Let's get going. There's a pool in the middle of this woods. I feel like I'm in Narnia. If I jump into that pool, where will it take me? Maybe I should draw that <laughs> and paint it. I think I'll sit down and do that. All right, so welcome to my studio today. So I'm gonna draw this beautiful pond, but I wanna show you what I have in my pouch. I'm just gonna take out the basics. If you wanna see completely what I bring in my watercolor pouch, but today I'm just gonna take out the basics. So I have a folder that I've made from a folder. I cut it down and I taped it closed. I put in some colored papers and um, I may do a drawing of a tree trunk with some white pen or pencil and um, colored chalk, whatever. And then I will use a watercolor paper today for this because I just love the colors in this water and the green gorgeous moss that you see in here. And then this is basically my easel top thing <laughs> so I take these clips off and this is just plastic corrugated cardboard and I have it scored um, just here so that I can fold it up and put it in here but it still stays together so this is my little watercolor cups tiny tiny little flask that I got in Ireland um, I have a tiny little spray bottle that I use to um, make my watercolor palette wet I do have a larger flask for water just for carrying this is um, a wrist, what, wrist cuff, and I put this on to wipe my brush on when I'm painting. I do keep that in a plastic bag with holes in it so it doesn't get all gross. I love um, paper towels just to wipe off my palette. Now, um, I get, I found my um, little watercolor palette, I found this little tin at an antique store, and I put the these little um, watercolor little tins. You can buy the, just the tins through Art Toolkit and I'll have a link below. They also sell little tins like this. Um, they're basically business card holders that you can put these in. They have a magnet on the bottom that these little tins like this will just sort of adhere to. Okay so those are those. Um, you can get them different sizes. You can get them this and even bigger. I like the little ones because for travel basically you don't need much more than this. But what I do here with this, and I thought that this little little tiny cigar case was just hysterical, so um, <laughs> I had to, I've used this one. I think it's funny. So I put these on um, little magnetic strips. They're just self-adhesive magnetic strips, and so I move those up there because I like to paint on a silver or gray or white background, and I didn't want to paint this lid white or whatever. So I move things up here. It takes just a minute. There. And then that is my palette. So I take this. Now I carry with me a bunch of these little magnets. Back of this palette, I flip it over, and on the back, I put the magnets and they hold the palette in place. They are brittle, sometimes they break, so it's fine. Anyway, not like that. Whatever, there's no rhyme or reason to that. It just needs to hold it. In place. Water on. I do have to be careful not to overfill these, but I'm gonna wait to clip this on until I'm done drawing my little picture in because it does tend to splash all over. My watercolor paper. I think I'll go horizontally. I think I'll just draw it for now. To get that done. And I just clip these on. I do have some artist tape in my bag, but I tend to prefer a simple clip. 
and I prefer to draw in pencil and then I watercolor paint and then I will ink it in the end. Okay, I like this perspective better from over here. I'm trying to decide how much scale to give this little pool in this entire painting. And I don't think I want to make it gigantic, but I just find it fascinating. Why is it here? <laughs> and, um, but I also want to give the forest some room for existence in my little picture. I don't think I'm going to put this big log laying across it that you can kind of see right over there. It is, from my perspective right here, it's a little bit distracting. And this is 140 pound cold pressed watercolor paper for as far as travel journals. This is kind of what I do for a travel journal. I, I bring um, my watercolor paper. I might bring, I bring a book. I've got some paper and books and so forth that I do enjoy working on, filling, but um, on the whole, I do prefer just to have an individual sheet like this. Look at those gorgeous colors in that water. I like to take some time when I work on my sketches. It, it kind of puts my head in the in the right place for understanding my scene. And um, just getting that close observation of nature. And I have no problem sitting on the floor of a forest. And I don't mind. so peaceful out here. Now we've got some of these beautiful reflections in the water that I want to make sure I, I get. I make sure to, to match what your drawing is. So often I think that we, we then go to the water and we copy what's in the water without really thinking about is that same tree that I just put here also <laughs> in my drawing in the same place. The tree, the reflection is showing the tree is much farther up the trunk. So we're getting some of these higher aspects of the tree. This is all shadowy on this side. But I think um, I'm at a pretty good place here where I can start getting my watercolor washes in place. Now I also find watercolors to be just a little less intimidating for people than oil paints. I don't know if it's because we get a set of watercolors when we're so little. <laughs> Our praying Crayola watercolor set. Um, or if it's because the cleanup is so easy, sometimes the concept of oil paints can feel intimidating with, you know, the hazards of chemicals and all that. I'm going to turn this sideways so that I have more room for my painting. So if you feel that way, then this is probably going to be a really good video for you to get you out into plein air painting. So that you feel less intimidated and you're willing to give it a go. Watercolors are so cheap to get started. You don't have to get this cute little setup. You can get Prang is an excellent uh, brand. Believe it or not, it's really good quality paint. I'm gonna put some water in my wee little cups with my wee little flask. 
How cute is that? Oh my goodness. I found this at a gas station in Ireland. <laughs> I love treasure hunting for my watercolor stuff. It is just, I don't know, an ongoing passion hobby. Um, so I got my, and this little spray bottle I found with my eyeglasses cleaner kit. So I washed it out really well and it's tiny. So I like it for my kit. I'm gonna clean, give this a good wipe. Thought I wiped it last time, but. Uh, just a collection of some sables, some, I use these little tiny chiseled stiff ones for um, rubbing out. Um, this is a, I made this brush. I bought this fish pen. It was a pen when I was like 19 <laughs> and I still have it, um, but I turned it into a paintbrush. So um, yeah, just some random, you know, edges, ch uh, chisel, so forth. So I'll just set those there and I've got my wrist cuff thing for wiping. Move that up just a little. So I'm going to try to hold this here so that you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm going to start with sort of a light gray because I see that is my lightest color. So I like to start with my blue. Now I have a transparent red oxide here that to me is more like burnt sienna. I have burnt sienna over here, but it, that is more like a bright orange, and I don't care for that as much. So I'm just going to put this over the whole background. But I'm going to watch out for that piece of grass in the distance, that sunny area. Put a little bit of, um, I can put blue in there, but let's try. Oh, I forgot to show you. This is my cheat sheet for the colors that I have on here. So I can kind of slide that in here if it helps. I can tell you what colors I'm using. There. More or less. <laughs> so let's take, I want some of that phthalo green with some of the bright green, or I'm sorry, the bright cad lemon yellow for that background. Oops, not light enough. Piece of grass where the sun is kind of hitting it way back there. And with watercolor, you always work in layers, working from your lightest light to your darkest dark. And so when you're looking at a scene like this, you have to assess what you need to sort of attack first. <laughs> um, so when I look at it all, I know that that spot in the water, of course, is so sunny bright. I have to leave that the white of the paper. So in order to make that really appear bright white, I'm going to have to make everything around it considerably darker. So I'm going to pile it up because I don't want that anymore right now. Okay, so I'm going to use some more of this transparent red oxide. Maybe some burnt umber. Just, I like the burnt umber because it's a little bit darker brown. Kind of chalkier, cooler brown. I'll add some blue to that. That's, I see that a lot in here. Okay. 
I'm going to come through and just make some of these trees a little bit the way distant ones very soft and a light gray if you can see that there. I should have moved that up sooner. Oh well, I can fix that or not. It's not a big deal. Maybe I'll make a little bit darker gray now. A little more sienna, a little more blue. I'll just pull out a few trees that maybe are a little closer. bigger ones. I see a little more um, yellow ochre in these trees too. I'm going to start doing a wash now of the ground in front of me. That is New Gamboge yellow and it is such a bright beautiful yellow. And I think I'll take some undersea green. That's what this green is here by Daniel Smith. That's gorgeous too. I'm just thinking about the moss that I see here and maybe some of that bright lemon yellow right as the sun is hitting it, right on the surface. But the sunnier you make the sunshine, <laughs> the, the stronger the shadows will appear. So you've got to make those equally as significant. If you just paint everything light, it, it won't have that same effect. This is just more of the undersea green. And I will be deepening some of that because it's just so beautiful. And I want those moss shadows to be nice and dark. Because everything else that we've done so far is background to support the main thing happening up front. Let's get some of those leaf colors in here too. And some yellow ochre, some of that transparent red oxide.
I don't mind leaving some of the texture of the paper through because it, um, it, it gives it sort of the sense that maybe some light is hitting some of those leaves and twigs and things. There's a little bit of a gray mixture here that I'll get in some of these areas. It's just some shadows. Now that this is a little bit drier back here, I can come through with some of these darker, maybe more neutral gray, browns, whatever. It's yellow ochre and blue. Give this tree a little bit of notice here. That's okay. Right, onto the water. Let's get some of that in there. So I'm seeing in the water some of this gorgeous transparent red oxide right along the edge where the leaves are and the twigs and things right as the light is approaching the edge. So I'm going to dot that in with some yellow ochre. Let some of those colors intermingle what else do I see some over here some down here Get some of that darker blue in there to really deepen some of those areas. Oops. I always silhouette that anyway. Now this green is um, jadeite, Oops, also by Daniel Smith that I'm using. It's a really rich, dark moss green, and I absolutely love it. I will never be without this green. It's just it's so gorgeous. I don't typically buy 
pre-mixed greens, but when it comes to watercolor, I don't mind to um, pick up some extra colors because they're so light and it's really not that big of a deal to squeeze a little thing of color on my little square and bring it with. So I like to grab a few of those interesting color choices. Especially Daniel Smith has some gorgeous um, jewel tone colors. Worth checking out. Okay, back to the water. Now there are some um, reflections in the water of the sky. So let's get those light blue, sort of actually they're more like a light gray. Just use some of the gray I have on here. I'll just activate that a little. No, I'm still getting yellow ochre. And remember, we have to keep that passage white. Just the smallest bit. I know that probably doesn't really show up on camera. get that really really bright now I'm gonna to have to come in with the darker gray oops, around it to showcase that now some of the trees that are in this water I can come through here with a pen and draw those little branches and things. Cut this one right through the pond. We've got a blue shadow streaking back this way. They're just more sticks and twigs and things that just indicate life and different things that are on the forest floor. I might lay a few of those in on the water. Leaves and little things. get some more of these um, sort of that reflection of the leaves in the water over there the beautiful burnt sienna yellow ochre type situation now I don't want any of these light areas to compete with the Sun so I'm just knocking those down a little bit
So I'm putting some warmer colors of the leaves and things up front just to indicate the nearness of all this. Get this is up close. I don't want to lose my white patches in here, so I'm going to be careful about those. some finishing passages on here and I'll ink this study we'll see what we have yeah. I think it's ready for some ink let's see what we can do with that I'm gonna put some of this away and then I'll get my inks out for pens I have a um, micron and this is 0 0.05 and this is just a 0.3, so I'll use the thicker one. 0.3 is a thicker pen, so I'll use that up close. And then the 0 0.05, and sometimes I use a 0 0.05 for the whole thing, but that is typically, you use the smaller pen tip for the distant um, lines. And the reason I prefer to ink afterwards is because I can kind of redefine some things that got lost. And sometimes the watercolor paint We'll do different things that I didn't really anticipate and I capitalize on that. I, I kind of make good come of a weird thing that happened with the paint so um, I don't feel quite as uh, restricted when I do the inking afterwards. Um, also I don't feel like I'm so much doing a, a sort of a coloring book. <laughs> if it's already inked I feel like I'm committed to the lines and I don't know to me that just feels stiff and and I like to have more flexibility in my painting and so that's why but one thing I really want to encourage you to do I mean you've seen how simple this uh, was to just get out here find a nice quiet spot and you know sit down and start drawing it wasn't a really big operation you know I didn't there was no fanfare I didn't have to get my easels out and I just sat down <laughs> and um, just started drawing and all of this equipment it didn't cost very much at all I like to cut my paper into smaller uh, manageable sizes that I throw in a folder and get what works for you there are lots of different kinds of paper out on the market. I used to use a lot of hot pressed paper because I liked it for my illustrations because I could get more detailed. But I have come to find that I think with cold pressed, it um, stays wet longer when it's uh, more textured. And I like that better. So I like to be able to sort of work the layers more and work some of the information with greater detail. Um, so if I have it, the paper making the paint dry really fast, like the hot press does, I, I find I don't get to move the paint around as much. I can't manipulate the layers and, and all that. So this one being a little closer, I'm going to spend a little more time on the roots and the formation of the tree. There's a shift in that value, but we'll work with it. I like it. Looks like I did it on purpose. <laughs> we'll just go with that. Yeah, yeah, I did that on purpose. Now, where I really wanted to concentrate my efforts on this is around this pond because I thought it was so neat. On tree bark, I like to use shorter pen strokes like that to indicate texture. Tree bark is um, kind of like people. It, it'll indicate the depth of wrinkles, indicate the age. <laughs> nice, huh? 
but it works for trees too. And, and you can tell the age of a tree oftentimes. I mean, you can't tell how old it is, but you can tell that it is old by the depth of the wrinkles on the type of a tree that it is. So deep folds indicate age. And um, the younger the tree, the smoother the bark, obviously. So just, there you go. I think this pen is about toast. So when I need a good strong value, um, I'll use just a nice basic cross hatching. But when I want texture, then I go in with a tighter, more um, sort of a curved line cross hatching. All right, now I'm gonna add some of the texture around the pond. Some of these interesting little formations. And you can get, if you're working on something that has a lot of detail and information, you can make it as detailed or as not detailed as you want. All right, well, I don't think that that needs to go much further beyond that. So I'm just gonna sign it. And I like to date my studies. So this is 312-24, almost St. Patrick's Day. All right, everyone, well, that wraps us up. Thank you for joining me in the woods today. I hope you enjoyed this and we'll find the time to get out and enjoy nature. And um, you will kind of use this as sort of a diving board for plein air painting, um, because this is plein air painting, but in a very simple, very non-threatening approach. All right, you guys, I will see you next time and have a good weekend and happy St. Patrick's Day. All right, bye-bye.